Thank you, brothers, for leading us in worship. Good morning. What an honor to be with you today. I'm grateful to Dr. Muller and to the seminary for the invitation. Thanks to faculty, colleagues, and Boyce College Southern Seminary students for being here today. I'm truly humbled to open God's Word with you. Let's take our copies of God's Word and turn now to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 9 through 22. And I have to say, if there was one person in all the world with whom I could sing a duet in Broadest Chapel, it would be you, Dr. Aiken. <laughs> Nothing's changed in these 20 years, brother. Appreciate you so much. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 22. I know we just got seated, but would you please stand with me again as we honor the reading of God's word from 2 Timothy 4, verses 9 through 22. Paul writes under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books and above all the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophimus, who was ill at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. This is God's word. You could be seated. Well, that great Kentuckian Daniel Boone was known for always being prepared for every journey, and that held true for his final journey, too. Several years before his death, when he felt old age creeping up on him, he had a beautiful coffin made of cherry wood, custom-fitted for himself. He was very happy with the finished product and kept it in his room. He usually stored it under his bed, but he would often drag it out to admire it. Visitors often caught Daniel Boone polishing that coffin, whistling peacefully to himself as he considered the quality of the craftsmanship. A little bit more disturbing is when his visitors would find him having climbed into that casket to make sure that it still fit, uh, that he hadn't outgrown it in some of his less active years. Most disturbing of all is when his children and grandchildren caught him taking a nap inside that custom fit coffin. That's quite a surprise to find Papa asleep in that cherry casket. We may find that a little bit morbid, a little bit over the top, uh, particularly for such a young crowd. Um, But what the Bible tells us is that there is wisdom in thinking about the end and in preparing for the end, even when you're just starting out. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 1 says, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death better than the day of birth. That's a curious statement, isn't it? To say that the day of death would be better than the day of birth. But I think the truth of the matter is, on the day of birth, we don't know if you're going to carry a good name all the way to the end. We don't know what's going to become of your life, but on the day of your death, we do. That's why later in Ecclesiastes 7, we're told that the end of a thing is in many ways better than the beginning because we know what you've done with this life that God has given to you. 
And that's why Ecclesiastes 7 goes on to say, it is better to go to the house of mourning, a funeral, than to go to the house of feasting, a party. Why? Because this is the end of all mankind and the living lay it to heart. There is wisdom and there is grace even for the young and the vibrant and the strong and the active for those just starting out to consider the end, to lay it to heart that one day I won't be at the beginning, I will be at the end and to consider what I want that end to look like. The Bible says there's wisdom in that. And this text that I've read for us, it helps us to do that to consider the end. It's the, the final words that we have in the final letter from the Apostle Paul. It's Paul at the end. And I, I know it's filled with the kinds of mundane sorts of uh, details and information, greetings and clerical work and all that sort of thing. It's the, it's, it's the kind of stuff that we tend to zip right through on our way to the rest of the New Testament. But I think if we'll look a little bit closer we'll find that Paul is showing us, modeling for us, how to finish well, what we want the end to look like for ourselves. And so as we leave this place today and go to class and receive the information and the tools to start off well in ministry, let's take a few moments to pause and lay to heart from the Apostle Paul how to end well, what we want the end to look like. It's a very personal passage, and I, I, I want to receive it very personally today. And so I want you to notice, first of all, the purpose that I want at the end. I see here the purpose that I want at the end. The apostle Paul is about to die. He's just told us so in verses six through eight, which is one of the Bible's most beautiful farewells. Maybe you're familiar with it. Help me out. He says, I have fought the good. I have run the, I have kept the, Henceforth, there's laid up for me a, that's very good. There's laid up for me a crown. That seems like a great place to end 2 Timothy. It's an excellent opportunity to sign off, but maybe like a lot of preachers, Paul just doesn't know when to quit because he keeps going past verse eight into this long section that we have uh, read today. And I, I would expect Paul, as he continues writing then to, to lean his head back against that cell wall and just take a break, just relax. It's time to rest. He's about to leave. But instead, in verses 9 through 22, we find the Apostle Paul to be as busy as ever. John Leland, that old Baptist who I like so much, would call him the busy little apostle. And the busy little apostle is just as active here at the end. Just look at the way that he speaks at the beginning of our text. He is strategizing for the advance of the gospel. He's got a map of the Roman world in his mind, thinking about where he needs to move the next piece to advance the kingdom of Jesus. He's deploying men to new cities. He's warning Timothy of opponents and obstacles. He's sending for partners who are valuable in the work, who are useful in ministry. He's calling for books and parchments. Paul still wants to read and learn and grow. It's an incredible sense of purpose all the way to the end. Paul is as focused on serving and living for the Lord Jesus at the end as he is on any page in the book of Acts. It's remarkable. Uh, Paul would say, I'm about to depart. The ropes of the ship are being loosened from the dock, but it hadn't sailed yet. For me to live is still Christ. My life is not about myself, but my life is a drink offering for the Lord Jesus being poured out for him and there's still a few drops left. And I want the Lord Jesus to have every last one of them. We might say that Paul plays all the way to the final whistle. Now, Dr. Aiken could tell you that there was a time when the Dallas Cowboys won Super Bowls. It's a long time ago, Dr. Aiken. Matter of fact, I believe some of these folks weren't even born the last time the Dallas Cowboys won a Super Bowl. But boy, there were some glory days in the early 90s. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And in 1993, I can remember the Cowboys being up real big on the Buffalo Bills. And uh, or maybe it was in the fourth quarter when uh, the great defensive tackle, uh, Leon Lett, 
forces a fumble, scoops it up, and he's running for the end zone. This is the one moment in this brother's life he's gonna score a touchdown. He says, all pro defensive tackle, and he's about to cross the goal line and just put the icing on the cake of this big Dallas Cowboy romp. But what does he do just before he gets to the goal line? He slows down to celebrate. And he wasn't counting on that Buffalo Bills wide receiver, Don Beebe, chasing him down the field, swiping that ball, forcing his own fumble, and dooming Leon let to every blooper reel until the Lord Jesus returns. Uh, We learn from this that bad things happen when you celebrate too soon. When you pull up too quick before you cross the goal line, that's not what Paul does. Paul is going to celebrate with Jesus, but he hasn't heard that last whistle yet. And so he plays all the way to the end. We must do the works of him who sent us while it is still day because night is coming when no man can work. Paul has incredible purpose all the way to the end. And to me, this stands out all the more poignantly in a letter where we meet so many individuals who drift from their purpose before the end. Paul mentions right here in verse 10, Demas, once Paul's trusted co-worker, once the kind of person who would have been in a room like this in a chapel service, going out to classrooms like those that you will go to later today. Demas was someone who labored side by side with Paul with great purpose in serving the Lord Jesus. But now Demas' heart has drifted and he's fallen in love with this present world. He is nowhere to be found. He's just somewhere off in Thessalonica. We meet others in 2 Timothy who've drifted from their purpose. Some have grown distracted by the world. Others are deceived by false teaching. Others disqualified by immoral and ungodly living. Y'all, that should sober us up today. But just because we're serving the Lord Jesus with purpose right now and with passion right now, that is no guarantee that we will continue to serve him with purpose all the way to the end. We are called to persevere, to press on, to build into our lives those practices that will keep our hearts warm towards the Lord Jesus and focused on his work. It's what Paul's been calling Timothy to throughout this letter, to endure, to continue on in what you have received, to fulfill your ministry. Friends, by God's grace, I want this kind of purpose at the end. I want it for me and I want it for you. It is very possible to start well, to serve with purpose for a season without finishing with purpose at the end. So how about you? Are you serving the Lord Jesus with purpose even right now as a student at Boyce College or at Southern Seminary? Have you built into your life those practices and called into your life those people who will help you persevere in purposeful, passionate ministry for Jesus' glory all the way to the end? That's the purpose I want at the end. But I also see here people I want at the end. I see the people I want at the end. Paul really doesn't have a whole lot when he gets to the end, does he? He doesn't have any books to read, He doesn't have anything to write with. He doesn't even have a cloak. Somebody get this brother a jacket or a blanket. He has nothing in this prison. But I tell you, there is one thing that Paul does have as we look at this text. Paul has people. We we look at this passage and we see all of these names that crowd these verses. Again, it's so easy to think of it just as a list for us to skip on uh, so that we can go to other more substantive things. But these names represent people, the people who fill Paul's mind and fill Paul's heart at the end. People who testify to a life spent loving and serving and investing and disciple making in the name of Jesus. Friends, I want people at the end. I want friends like Luke in verse 11. Proverbs 11, or excuse me, 17, 17 says, a, a friend loves at all times. A brother is born for adversity. I want there to be friends at the end who have stayed by me through thick and thin because of a shared love for Jesus and his work who stick with me when everybody else runs out. I want friends like that at the end. I want younger people at the end who I've invested in and trained like Kreskins and Titus and Tychicus in verses 10 and 12. Younger people who perhaps slow you down when you're in the midst of your own work and your own ministry and who require time and energy and patience and all this. But after you are gone, they will go places you can never go. 
and they will interact with people you will never meet and they will serve the Lord Jesus to an extent that you never will. I want people like that at the end. I want people like Prisca and Aquila in verse 19. You know, Paul says in Romans 16, three, that they risked their necks for his life. And I want people at the end who suffered and sacrificed in the trenches of ministry with me. And we've got the stories to prove it. I want local churches of ordinary people like many of those mentioned in our text who know and love God's word because of my very imperfect, but by God's grace, sincere ministry to them. And I want some Timothys. Paul's called him my beloved son in this letter. Twice in our text, verses nine and verse 21, he urges Timothy, come see me. I know that we'll meet again in a better world, but before I close my eyes on this one, I just wanna see you one more time. There are things that I want to share face to face, heart to heart. This is someone who hasn't just seen Paul in the public eye. Paul has shared his very life with him every single week since they've known one another. I want people like that at the end, Dr. Booker. People who, who knew me and walked with me and for all my sin and weakness and failure knew that I loved Jesus and I loved them. And so they will read God's word and they will sing to the Lord and they will lay me to rest and they'll do impressions of my crazy little voice. And then they'll go eat Mexican food and they'll keep serving Jesus. I want people like that here. And I want people like that there waiting for me to receive me into heavenly dwellings. I want people at the end. But if I want people at the end, I better start loving people right now, shouldn't I? If you want this kind of legacy of loving and serving and investing in people at the end, the time to start loving and serving and investing people is right now in the midst of your very busy life. I cannot live for self and have people at the end. Adrian Rogers said, the world's smallest package is a man wrapped up in himself. And I can't spend my life in that tiny little wrapped up package of me and expect there to be people at the end rising up and calling me blessed to the glory of God. I can't be more concerned with building a platform of virtual people, invisible people, pretend people, and ignore the real people right in front of me who the Lord has put before me. I can't be so task-oriented and goal-oriented even in ministry that I don't let people interrupt and inconvenience me. And I can't be quick to write off those who frustrate me and irritate me like Mark in verse 11. You know that Mark is the one who so disappointed Paul and aggravated Paul when he, when he left Paul and Barnabas on that first missionary journey. He was the cause of the split between Paul and Barnabas back in the book of Acts. And yet here we have years later in the providence of God, Mark has been discipled by the apostle Peter. He's experienced the mercy and the grace of God. Paul has been softened by the grace of God through the years. This man who has received such patience from Jesus has now learned to extend patience to others and at the end, he says, make sure you bring Mark. He is so useful to me. And if I want people at the end, I've got to learn to give grace right now. Maybe one of the great surprises that this text teaches us is that at the end, we'll be surprised by those who are not there with us. And we'll be surprised by those who are there. I want people at the end. But I also see here the perspective I want at the end, the perspective I want at the end. There's a dark side to this text. There's no getting around it. Living with gospel purpose, loving people in Jesus' name, y'all, it leaves scars. You can ask anyone in this room who's been in ministry for any length of time, it leaves scars. Or you can just listen to the apostle Paul. It's, it's almost as if he is reviewing his scars like some old sea captain here in this text. He, he reminds us that there are some in ministry who will desert you. I mean, back in Colossians 4.14, Demas was someone who Paul relied on. Demas was someone he loved, he trusted. Paul probably expected Demas to get up and read scripture at his funeral and tell stories about him at his funeral. But when times got tough, Demas's heart had drifted from Jesus to other things and he left Paul 
for the comforts of the world. And the truth of the matter is, in ministry, there are some people you will pour your life into and they will break your heart and they will desert you. There are others who will disappoint you. Paul expected these Roman Christians to show up for his trial. I mean, this is a big moment he'd been looking forward to. This is an opportunity to preach Christ at the center of the Roman world. And he kept watching that door for those friends to come through there and strengthen him by their presence. And they never showed up. We don't know why. Maybe they got scared to identify with Paul. Uh, Maybe they just got busy and forgot that it was the time for the trial. Maybe they really tried to get there, but they were actually just, just prevented. We don't know. What we do know is it was a painful, lonely moment for the apostle Paul. After all he'd done to pour into these believers, they didn't show up for him. And friends, in ministry, people who you show up for again and again will sometimes fail to show up for you. And they'll disappoint you. And then there's some who will despise you. Paul says that this Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm, verse 14. He opposed our message strongly. And the truth of the matter is, in ministry, some people will simply not like you. They will see you as a threat to their agenda. Sometimes they they will think that opposing you is serving the Lord. They may criticize you. They may slander you. They may glare at you while you preach and make it really hard to talk about the love of Jesus Christ. They may generally make your life difficult in a host of subtle ways. Paul knows about that. We need to know about that. We need this biblical category of enemies as we go into ministry. There were some who will despise you. But I want you to notice this. This is the important part. As Paul reviews these scars, we need to take note of his perspective. Yes, he's honest. He's honest about what went down. He's honest about the hurts and the the trials. But would you say the Apostle Paul is bitter in this text? I don't think so. I don't don't see the Apostle Paul vengeful either or wallowing in self-pity. But instead, here at the end, Paul is remarkably free. I'm reminded of that story of Jonathan Edwards when his longtime church had voted him out as pastor, but they were still using and abusing him as pulpit supply, even after they sent him packing. An observer watching Jonathan Edwards said he was like a man whose happiness was out of reach of his enemies. And that's what Paul seems to be like here. Paul is able to end his life free because he entrusts his ministry scars to Jesus. He doesn't curse Alexander, but in verse 14, he says, the Lord will repay him according to his deeds, we're all going to have to stand before the Lord Jesus and he will do what's right. He doesn't condemn the no-show Romans, but in verse 15, he prays, may it not be charged against them. I think Paul would tell us that scars in Jesus' service are inevitable, but they are so worth it. And they're also temporary, light momentary afflictions preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's the perspective I want at the end. Look, when I cross that river of death, I may carry some scars from serving the Lord Jesus, but I don't wanna be lugging any grudges around. I wanna trust that to the Lord. But friends, if that's the kind of free heart I want at the end, why not lay all that at Jesus' feet right now? Why not lay any bitterness? Why not lay any vengefulness. Why not lay any spirit of self-pity at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and just trust it with him and keep serving him now? And so we see the purpose that we want at the end, the perspective we want at the end, those people who we want at the end. But most importantly, I see here the presence I want to have at the end. Timothy may not make it by winter, Those Roman Christians may never show up for Paul. Even faithful Luke won't be able to make that final journey with him at the end. But Paul has one friend who can. In that soul-crushing moment in court, when no one showed up for Paul, suddenly he was aware of a presence at his side. The Lord Jesus Christ standing beside him strengthening him, taking this disappointing moment, 
this lonely moment, this painful moment into his hands and using it for good, enabling him to proclaim the message of the gospel to the Gentiles. And as Paul thinks about this moment of Jesus standing by him, strengthening him, showing up for him, enabling him, he, it's as if he looks back over the course of his entire life in ministry and says, this is just one of a countless times that Jesus has been my almighty friend, showing up for me. That time in Corinth when I was ready to give up and the Lord Jesus appeared to me and says, keep preaching, I'm with you and I have many in this city. Over and over again, the Lord Jesus has been present with Paul at every difficult ministry assignment and through every triumph and victory, empowering and energizing and blessing, Jesus has been that friend who sticks closer than a brother for Paul all through the years. Paul says, as I look back at my ministry, here's, here's my biography in one sentence. I'm a helpless little sheep who Jesus has rescued from the lion's mouth again and again and again. And so now when I come to the end, to that final crisis, when it's time for me to enter into those cold waters of death, I have nothing to fear because the Lord Jesus will deliver me safely from every evil deed into his heavenly kingdom. My friend will be with me I have a friend in Jesus who knows what it means to be disappointed by friends who run off and abandon him. I have a friend in Jesus who knows what it means to be despised by people who should have loved him and served him. I know what it means to have a friend in Jesus who's been deserted by all in order to bear my sin at the cross and then to rise from the dead three days later to be my never failing, all sufficient friend, the one who truly sticks closer than a brother, the one who promises me, me who deserves nothing from Jesus, Jesus promises to me, I will never leave you or forsake you. All through the ministry years and even at the hour of death, I know whom I have believed, says Paul. Now he knows what he's believed and we're thankful for that. Paul knows a lot of wonderful doctrinal truth, but at the bottom, that doctrine is teaching us about who Paul has believed. The living Lord Jesus Christ, the friend who has loved him and given himself for him. Ministry is going to be over for Paul here very shortly after he writes these words. Friends, I know we're just starting out, but at some point ministry is going to be over for you too. But fellowship and friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ, man, that's eternal. And if I want this strong sense of the presence of the Lord Jesus at the end, then there could be no higher priority in my life than cultivating friendship and fellowship with the Lord Jesus right now. It's more important than your studies. It's more important than that ministry opportunity. It's more important than anything. What a friend we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm reminded to look out and uh, see friends who've taught me so much of uh, Pilgrim's Progress Part 2, the uh, very uh, vastly underrated Pilgrim's Progress Part 2. That's the story of this little church, this community of faith, making their way through this world to the celestial city. And at the end, you may be familiar with the scene, all the pilgrims have made it to the river, to Beulah Land, and they're just waiting. They're just waiting to receive their personal summons from the king to step into the waters and cross over to the other side. And one day this courageous minister of the gospel, valiant for truth, here's his name called. And he shares the news with his friends that he'll soon be leaving and going over to the other side. And this is what he says, I am going to my father's and though with great difficulty I have got hither, yet now I do not regret all the trouble I've been at to arrive where I am. My sword I give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage and my courage and skill to him that can get it. My marks and scars I carry with me to be a witness for me that I have fought his battles who will now be my rewarder. And when the day that he must go hence was come, many accompanied him to the riverside into which as he went, he said, death, where is thy sting? And as he went down deeper, he said, grave, where is thy victory? 
So he passed over and all the trumpets sounded for him on the other side. Paul heard those trumpets. I want to hear those trumpets. I want to walk with this Jesus and serve him all the way to the end. I hope that you do too. Let's pray. And now, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, who loved us and gave himself for us, who called us into this ministry, who is more valuable than anything this world affords, we, we look to you now for the help and the strength that we need to endure with joy in your service all the way to the end for the glory of your great name. And in Jesus' name we ask it, amen.